Hello everyone, welcome to this video about forgetting about the Dorian mode and learning a magical minor shape. Well, that's the title of the video and I mean, maybe I don't mean it literally. The Dorian mode is still very useful, but I've noticed whenever I put the word mode in the title or scale or something that a lot of guitar players search for, the video gets many more uh, views and you know, that's the reality of YouTube. You gotta get those views. But uh, I wasn't completely clickbaiting you. I wanna talk about, um, instead of using the Dorian scale as a sound to play over the two chord in the 251, to use uh, a certain minor seven shape, uh, which I think is very handy to start 251s. And those, that shape is in two places, I mean, it's in more places, but for me, it's in two places on the guitar. And they sound the same, because it's the same notes, but because it's in two different places, uh, the continuation of that phrase, uh, mostly what you be playing on the five and the one chord, uh, sounds very different. And I don't want to make this video too long, because I already have a lot of lines uh, for one shape, so I'm going to make two videos. This first video is about uh, the lower shape, the shape lower on the neck, and then the second video, which I will make later, is about the shape higher on the neck. And I'm talking about this uh, shape. It's just a standard A minor 7, A, C, E, G. And that shape is also here. So th that shape is for the second video, but today I just want to look at this shape. And um, the way I think about it, it's very easy. A minor is here, and the shape is also here. There's the root. Now I've noticed that there are many 251 licks, phrases, that start with kind of this shape, or exactly this shape, but sometimes it's descending, sometimes it's uh, descending, sometimes it's, it's ascending. And um, I try to give you some contrasting phrases uh, when it comes to style. So I have some really typical bebop licks and some typical gypsy jazz phrases, but they both incorporate uh, this little shape. So um, the first shape, I'm just going to play all the phrases very slow or slow, uh, and then I'm going to explain what's happening or how I think about the, the phrase. And then I'll play it with a backing track so that you can play along with me, or practice with me on a site called Sound Slice, like usual. And if you wanna see how that works, just click on the link under this video, the Sound Slice link. And as always, if you like the videos on this channel and want me to make more, you could do me a favor and like the videos, subscribe to my channel, and if you want to do even more, you could always take a look at my Patreon. It's linked under the video. And yesterday was the first day I uploaded my monthly PDFs with all the tab from the videos I produced until then. And the first PDF was 35 or, or 32, or at least 30 or more pages filled with tab. Uh, of course, with the video title, so you can always have the tab there and look at the video on YouTube. Of course, you don't have to do that. You can just watch the videos on YouTube. There will always be tap on the screen and uh, that works great too. So let's get started. Um, the first phrase is a, a typical bebop kind of phrase. It goes like this. One, two, three, four. So, uh, 
uh, the nice things about uh, this phrase is, um, of course, the ending. That's a nice little triplet phrase for uh, G major. For the rest, it's kind of a standard uh, bebop line with a flat nine in there, the E flat. Typical bebop. They call that an enclosure. This kind of chromatic thing. Now, you know me, I don't want to go too much into theory. I got a question on our video. Um, a guy asked me, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, he, he, he writes, but I can't help but look at the phrase and applying all the theory knowledge I have uh, to analyze the phrase. Is that a bad thing? Of, of course, that's not a bad thing. I mean, I can do that too, uh, but I try to avoid it. And the reason I try to avoid it is because I'm much more interested in the sound of the phrase. And I, I feel that analyzing it too much, like analyzing it beyond the point of, let's say, I want to know which chords, of course, it's played against. And I kind of want to know if it's very, uh, if it's altered, for example, or if it's not altered at all, like if it's very sweet sounding or uh, if it creates a lot of tension. So for this line, for example, I know there's a flat nine in it, so it's cre it, it creates some tension, but there is no sharp nine in it, for, for instance. But I, I find that if you just focus on what the phrase sounds like and try to remember that, so can you sing the phrase? Once you got the line in your in your head, in your ears, you start hearing it at appropriate times, and that's how I want to train myself. Okay, so um, yeah, there's not not much more to say. Let's play it with the with the backing track. <laughs> Great little phrase. The second phrase uh, starts the same, uh, only it plays the uh, minor seven shape up and down. And I always start before the beat, uh, before the bar, right? I do one, two, three, four, with this lead tone with the G sharp, but you don't have to do that. It's just, I, I think it's nice to kind of hide this very plain minor seven arpeggio in chromatic no approach notes. But you could just start one, two, three, four. But you see, if you if you add that G sharp before one, two, three, four, it becomes a little bit more attractive. You could even add two notes: one, two, three, or three. One, two, three. Okay, but for this for these examples, I just played a G sharp before. So the second phrase goes like this: one, two, three, four. Again, typical bebop. The nice things about this is the large interval jump from the F sharp to the flat nine to the to the E flat, and then this augmented D augmented triad. And these are the kinds of sounds I want to put into my ears. That augmented sound, because it's that's typical a sound that you'll hear in in bebop in a 2-5. And it, it nice, it ends on this major 7. So, um, yeah, I think it's pretty clear what's happening. Let's play it with the backing track. For the gypsy jazz pickers amongst you, I think it's a good idea to pick the high G with a downstroke. That you get two downstrokes because that makes the rest of the phrase easier. Of course, if you're not a gypsy jazz picker, or if you're just alternate or economy, do whatever you do, it all works. 
the next phrase is a typical gypsy jazz phrase. And it's, it comes from an idea by Stochelo, Stochel Rosenberg. And it extends the arpeggio to the nine. This B. And then there's this, which is A flat seven, uh, which is the tritone sub for D. Right, so, but I don't think about that. I just tell you now, and I would categorize it as oh, it's one of those tritone licks, the tritone sub licks, because that has a uh, particular sound to it when you s you substitute in your solo the the normal uh, dominant with the tritone sub. So I, I substitute D7 with A flat 7. Okay, it goes like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, let's play it with the backing track. Great little line. Uh, the next phrase is uh, similar to this one. Now I'm going to play two phrases that use this shape but going the other way, going down. And this one is very similar to the last one. It uses this A flat uh, tritone sound again. And it starts on the root. So I kind of extend the, the shape to the root. But that's also how I see it, right? Because this A minor, I see it like that. So it goes like this. Uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Exactly the same ending as the last one. Um, but it's nice, let's say you come from E7 before, you just play a standard diminished arpeggio. Okay, let's play it with the backing track. If you, if you play this and you do the slide, make it clear. Maybe I wasn't play, playing it that clear in the examples. And then this pull off, make a clear pull off. And then the last phrase for this little system, because there's more coming, um, starts the same, but now it's a real bebop lick. I think I got this phrase from uh, Pasqu Pasquale Grasso, and it goes like this, one, two, three, four. So what's nice about this one? I like this. All these slides. Then the D augmented again. And then this. 
So it's, it's another way of playing these bebop enclosures. And you could play it long, or you could play... And uh, you, you might ask me, how does it work with these enclosures? Because that's the interesting thing. I've never studied how enclosures work, but I, I did find this video on YouTube explaining the theory behind enclosures. It was fascinating. And there's terms for every kind of enclosure. And they have crazy terms like double chromatic approach enclosure. And I thought, because I heard all these enclosures and I know all of them, but not because I studied them that way, because just I learned phrases that had different kinds of enclosures. I listened to a phrase in the solo. I said, oh, that's nice. I've never heard that before. I transcribe it. And then I learn a new uh, enclosures. And all these enclosures, they're kind of similar. They, they're around the same frets, right? Because I try to uh, put many of the 251 uh, phrases I, I transcribe in this position. So all the enclosures I play, usually on the one chord, they're also in the same position. So I start connecting them. So instead of learning all these crazy uh, triple chromatic uh, approach, turnaround, do the hokey pokey uh, enclosures, the theory behind it, just learn phrases with enclosures and then you find, you start combining them. So for instance, this phrase could end the way it says in the tap. <laughs> Or maybe some other crazy kind of enclosure I, I, I can think of now, and maybe I don't know yet. Uh, so that's my, my philosophy, right? You, you want to learn something, you transcribe it. So that you are attracted to it with your ear before you, are, before you learn some theory and then learn it the other way around. I think that's a more difficult way to learn things, also to be able to put it in your system. If you start transcribing things that you are attracted to, it means that your ear likes it and there's a much bigger chance of you actually starting to use it. Okay, um, let's play it with the, or is there more to say about this? No, let's play with the backing track. Okay, so I was talking about another system because of this is logical, and you know, I'm, I'm playing this A minor seven arpeggio on an A minor chord. But I was talking about the Dorian scale. It's in the title of the video also, and the reason I was talking about it was because what Dorian is is a minor scale with a minor third, and it has a uh, a six a minor seven and an 11 in there. So if we're talking about D, let's say D Dorian, uh, then it's F, the third, the G, 11, the B, that's the six, and then the C, that's a minor seven, and the E, that's the nine, a natural nine. Now, if you play this A minor shape over D minor seven, you have the flat seven, the nine, and the 11. So you're kind of, or, or kind of, you're actually playing Dorian when you do that. You don't have to learn the skill, you just play the shape and you're playing Dorian. Uh, you could say, well, there's no B. But if you play the shape here, you can play that B right there. Or you could, right? But all the phrases I chose for you that use this principle, that don't, they don't have that B. So the thing to make this work on a 2-5-1 in C, right, so you play this on uh, D minor 7, is that you after you play this A minor shape, you resolve to an F. And then you play some line for a G7. To C. To the F with an enclosure. So 
you learned this shape, and now you can use it both on a 2-5-1 in G and C, and that's very handy, because if you have a song in G, a lot of the time, it also goes to C at one point, right? You have this A minor, D7, G, and then you, uh, you get D minor, G7, C. So you can start from the same frets, very easy. So I've selected some lines that use this principle, and you will notice that they always play the shape and then go to an F. Okay, so the first line goes like this. One, two, three, four. Two, five, one in C, right? D minor, G7, C. One, two, three, four. Sorry, three, four. So what's nice about this? Well, of course, it's A minor shape. I like that. I've no idea what it is. And closer to the G. You have the flat 13. And, well, I don't know, it's a flat 13 and there's a, sh and a flat 9, so it's altered. But, you know, I would just remember this sound as altered, but I would recognize it also as altered, so I don't have to actually even know what the notes are. I just know that this is a very nice 251, altered 251 for a uh, 251 in C. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Like this just sounds very nice on C. Um, let's play it with the backing track. So the next one I use the same principle again, playing A minor before. Uh, on the 2-5-1 in, uh, in C. But now it starts before uh, the 2-5-1 starts, so one bar before. So it's like a up bar or something. Like one, two, three, four, one. And now this, is the, this A is the first note of the 2-5-1. You can see it in the tap. So it sounds like this. One, two, three, four, one. One, two, three, four, one. Yeah, this is a typical bebop thing. You hear it played by saxophone players, trumpet players, piano players, guitar players. This thing, you know, it comes from this moving note. D minor, right? And then this. This kind of phrases. They all come from a trumpet player called Clifford Brown. And he has many of these uh, 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 quotes that kind of sound like they come from a song. Maybe this even comes from a song. But like another thing that is, is played by him is... Uh, Stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, this is a lick that I like to play, and I just combined this this principle with the Clifford Brown. And if you play that, people will recognize it. If knowledgeable, I mean, everybody will like it because it just sounds fun, you know. But knowledgeable jazz people will recognize that you're quoting Clifford Brown, and it, it is appreciated. Um, like just like if you would play. You're playing a quote from Charlie Parker from Cool Blue, so people appreciate appreciate these kind of things. So let's um, play it with a backing track. Mm -hmm. So I have to start immediately after I, you know what? I'm gonna play. Let the backing track play one, two, five, and then I'll start after the uh, first one because I have to start before. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Okay, um, the next one, um, same principle, A minor 7 over D minor, but this is a typical gypsy jazz one. And it uses F minor played on the G7, which is a typical Django thing, but it is done now by all gypsy jazz players, including Stockel Rosenberg. I do it all the time. So the phrase goes like this. One, two, three, four. Uh, sorry, three, four. One, two, three, four. So you get this F minor six. Typical gypsy jazz way of playing a minor six arpeggio on the G7. So it, it creates a sus flat nine sound if you're interested in it, but it's just, I remember it as playing F minor over G7. And it sounds, it's a great sound. And one more time one, two, three, four. <laughs> Of course, you don't actually have to play these exact rhythms, right? These are just examples, and you can play with it. You don't have to start at the exact same place. You can start early, late. Uh, it's nice if you don't change chords exactly at the same time as the, uh, at the same time as the rhythm. If you uh, change a little bit before, so if you would start this lick earlier, it's a, it's a nice effect. And um, you can play. You, now the rhythm says, but you could also play three, four, one. Just experiment with all these phrases. You can experiment with different rhythms. Let's play with the backing track. And then the last phrase uh, uses the same principle playing F minor six, but it's a shorter arpeggio. And the ending is a real typical Django thing. It's maybe one of Django's best, well, I don't want to say best phrases, but this effect is typical Django, and I don't hear it often enough. And a modern jazz guitar player would never play it, but they should, because it's really nice. And it goes like this. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I mean, the beginning is the same, right? It's a A minor, F minor six. And then you play. If you look at the notes, it's, it's just C, C, G, C, C, G, C. You know, it's just the root and the fifth. But this uh, bend turns it into something special. And you have to bend it like Django. So you bend slow, slowly to the note, and you bend back. with a sensitive touch. Let's play with the backing track. There you go. Uh, a lot of really cool phrases using this simple shape to get you started. So next time in the second video that goes with this video, might not be uh, maybe the next video, but soon we're going to look at this shape, which are the exact same notes. But because we're at a different place of the neck, it gives us different possibilities. You get stuff like... Uh, or... It's, it's a different sound up here. Okay, so that's for next time. Try this, um, try this shape out. Just take songs and, you know, you can take these phrases 
And you don't have to play these phrases exactly as I, t- as I taught you to them, right? You could maybe mix and match or change the rhythms. Um, you could improvise with these phrases. So forget about the Dorian modes and use this shape instead. Okay, that was it. See you next time. Bye.